Uh, you need to over inflate your church attendance. You need to make sure you got additional pounds in the spare tire of your life. Make sure you got adequate time on the clock when it comes to church. Because when life runs flat, you don't want your worship to go flat. You don't want your relationship with God to go flat. You don't want your spirituality to go flat. Tell somebody, pump me up. Today I want to talk from the subject, the danger of being at the church, but not in the church. The danger of being at the church, but not in the church. The story of Joab is a classic case of what it means to be at church, but your heart and mind is far from God. There used to be an old secular song which said, your body is here with me, but your mind is on the other side of town. And you know, that's how it is for many people when they come to church. Their body is here, but their mind is somewhere else. Somebody right now is thinking about what they're going to do after church. Thinking about where they're going for brunch. What they're going to eat. Thinking about how they're going to spend their evening. It's very difficult to get people to be present in the moment. And an amen goes right there. Technology interferes with people's ability to be in the moment. You can sit at the table with someone and yet be on your cell phone at the same time, focusing on somebody else that's not even at the table. You can be distracted with the catching up on your Facebook, trying to keep up with other folk lives, activities, what they doing, where they've been, who they with and what they eating and all of that. And fail to engage with the person that's seated right across from you. In fact, you can get up on Sunday morning, get dressed, drive across town to the church, walk in, sit down in the pew, take out your electronic device and start catching up on other stuff. Mm-hmm, quiet in here. <laughs> Body's here, but your mind is in cyberspace somewhere in the universe. The challenge is to be present, participating, and perceiving. The challenge is to be in the moment. When we look at our text, and as we eavesdrop upon this text, we discover uh, that King David is coming to the close of his life, and now he's giving instructions to his son Solomon, who is going to become the new king over Israel. He's heir to the throne. And as David is talking to Solomon in uh, first Kings chapter 2 he gives him some information that he needs he gives him some insight that he needs but then he also gives him some instruction concerning what he should do as he comes into power and as he enters upon the throne and here's what David is saying to Solomon now son I got some unfinished business uh, from my administration I got some matters that I think you need to handle uh, right away as you enter upon the throne. And so uh, King David gives Solomon a list of people who need to be dealt with because of how they have mishandled things during his administration. The, the list consisted of some people who had double-crossed him, backstabbed him, undermined his leadership, disregarded his authority. In short, some people who were not trustworthy as well as some people who were not faithful and, 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 and most importantly, they were not loyal. 
And so he says, uh, I got a list of people I want you to be mindful of. I want you to be aware of them. Now, what's interesting, though, is in that list of uh, people that King David gave Solomon, he, he lists one individual, he said, that has been uh, a friend and been a help. And for them, I, uh, I want you to take care of them. I want you to look out for them. But now the rest of them, I got a priest. I want you to put him out in the office. I got some other folk I need you to kill. And uh, I need you to set some things in order, finish up what I was not able to do. And, and, and I wish I had time, really, um, to uh, work on each of these names in the text in, in, in that chapter. Uh, but time won't permit but, I mean, there are a lot of lessons to learn how uh, things will catch up with you sooner or later. And, and sooner or later, you're going to have to uh, reconcile what you've done. That's why you got to be careful how you handle life. And just because it seems like you're getting away and getting by, doesn't mean it ain't going to catch up with you sooner or later. And so when kings came into power in biblical days, they had a way of settling the score uh, and clearing the runway for the new administration. And often it happened as a result of death, default, or decision. And so now King David is giving Solomon uh, a hit list, if you will. Here's some folk um, that are on my hit list. Here's some people you need to handle. And there's one person in particular out of this list in 2 Kings, uh, I mean, 1 Kings chapter 2, that I want to give you on today as a spotlight. I want to focus on a man by the name of Joab. Tell somebody Joab. Uh, Joab was considered as a scoundrel in the Bible. Uh, Joab was guilty of killing uh, the head of King David's army, but then he also killed the head of Absalom's army. And, and, and now David uh, says, I want him uh, killed. I want him dead because of what he did to the head of my army and what he did to the head of Absalom's army. Now that's an interesting footnote to pay attention to because Absalom was David's son who rebelled against him, undermined his leadership and authority, discounted and disregarded him as his father. And if anybody, you know, it seemed like David should be mad at, he should have been mad at Absalom and he should have celebrated anybody that showed Absalom that you ain't all you think you are. And in fact, I'm taking out the head of your army because Absalom organized an army to go against his own daddy as king. But check this thing out. Uh, king David said, I, I want you to get Joab. I know Joab killed the head of Absalom's army, and I know you think I ought to celebrate that, but, but I, I want you to know that I'm holding him accountable for that. And, and what that really simply says to us today, this is a lesson for free. And, and you've heard that old statement that blood is thicker than water. And, and that's why you ought not get into other folks' family matters. Because in as much as uh, David had every right to be mad at Absalom, in as much as uh, David, yeah, uh, could have uh, patted Joab on the back for what he did for him. Uh, no, no, you discover that a father's love transcends what a child has done. And so David is saying, Absalom, yeah, he's been a fool. He's, he's mistreated me. He's dogged me out, undermined my leadership. And he has sat in the gate and talked against me, but he's still my boy. Mm -hmm. Tell somebody, family matters. And so David is saying, hey, uh, I want you to get Joab, but not only what he did to my uh, commander of the army, but I wanted him dead because of what he did to Absalom's head of his army. Now listen, I need to say something else. King Solomon appointed ben <laughs> to become his hit man. No, no joke, no exaggeration. Uh, whenever there was a transfer of power, there was a lot of bloodshed that took place to clear the runway and let folk know, uh, you better not play with this new king. And so Solomon hires Benaniah to become his hit man, Benaniah. He first of all kills Adonijah. And uh, now the word get to Joab, his partner in crime, and says, uh, the king has you on his hit list and you next. And so Joab, uh, when he heard of the death of Adonijah, and then found out he was on the hit list and he discovered that he's next, uh, Joab takes off running. He's looking for a hiding place. He's trying to escape the penalty that is before him. 
And so as he's running, <laughs> trying to find a hiding place, all of a sudden, the only thought that could come to mind for him was, I'm going to run to the church. I'm going to hide in the church. Yeah. Because in biblical days, the sanctuary provided a place of sanction, a place of asylum. And so here's what Joab is thinking. If I run to church, hide in the church, surely the king won't kill me in church. The king doesn't want to desecrate the temple by killing me in church. And so I'm safe if I can get to church. He can't touch me now because I'm in church. What brings you to church today? Everybody doesn't come for the same reason. <laughs> what are you running from? Uh, or who are you running from? Mm. But more importantly, who are you running to? Well, I want to suggest that in as much as Joab was running from Benaniah and running from King Solomon, he was not running to the Lord. He just ran into the church as a place to escape and a place to hide. Joab was at church, but he was not in church. Joab's heart was far from God. And here's how you know when a person is at church, but not in church. Uh, as I unload my little red wagon, here it is. Number one, Joab was guilty of inconsistent worship. I said Joab was guilty of inconsistent worship, which led to inadequate worship. In other words, Joab was a hit and miss fella when it came to attending church. Matter of fact, when you read the Bible and you study the life of Joab, you really don't find anything in there that indicates something about his spirituality. You, you really don't find anything in there that talks about him being uh, a, a part of worship or uh, a part of the praise team or the hallelujah chorus or serving as an usher on the door or a part of the greeters ministry, uh, or, or, or the deacon board, nothing. No, he wasn't a part of anything in the church. Church was far from his mind. But it's amazing when we find ourselves in a crisis. There it is, yeah. Uh, we start thinking about <laughs> church when we find ourselves in a crisis. Oh, I better go to church this week. <laughs> I've heard people say that. Like, what about all those other weeks? Yeah, I better go this week. And then, and then, and then, and then, uh, yeah, oh, I've been, I've been reading my Bible ever since uh, I, 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 I hit this, uh, you know, this uh, crisis in my life. Yeah. Yeah, I've been praying to God. Really? You ain't been talking about the Bible. You ain't been talking about praying all this time. But when a crisis come, that's when you show up as though we're going to hold God in contempt. I'm in church now, God. You're obligated to do something for me. Really? Crisis-oriented faith. You know, uh, I want to suggest to you, you know, that your faith ought to be bigger than a crisis and ought to be more consistent than a crisis. Joab's worship was based on crises. Mm -hmm. um, and many people join church based on the crisis, but when the crisis in, they fall out of the fellowship. Uh, you remember when the nation experienced terrorist attack during 9-11? People packed out our churches. You couldn't get in church. But as soon as the fear uh, uh, went away, uh, they fell away from the fold. Crises, you know. You ought not treat church like a spare tire. Uh, some people treat church like a spare tire. They, they, they only come to church when their life runs flat. Uh, they, don't, they only check the trunk uh, when, when life goes flat. I, I was putting some air in my car the other day, and I checked the tag in the door, and it said, you need 35 pounds in the front tire, and then you need uh, 44 pounds in the rear tire. And I kept reading the tag. It said, and the spare tire needs 60 pounds. And I thought about that. I said, hmm, 35 in the front tire, 44 in the back tire, Spare tire needs 60 pounds. I said, oh, so what uh, the manufacturer is saying is uh, I need to put more air 
in the spare time that's riding in the trunk, even though I'm not going to use it every day, but I need to overinflate it because it's going to lose some air just riding in the trunk. And when I call for it, I need to know that it's got an adequate amount of air to help me get to my next destination when the wheels I'm counting on go flat. I wish I had a witness here. And I need to tell somebody, you can't spend too much time in church. Uh, you need to overinflate your church attendance. You need to make sure you got additional pounds in the spare tire of your life. Make sure you got adequate time on the clock when it comes to church. Because when life runs flat, you don't want your worship to go flat. You don't want your relationship with God to go flat. You don't want your spirituality to go flat. Tell somebody, pump me up. Joab's worship was based on convenience. Got a lot of hit and miss Christians in the church. Every once in a while. CME saints. Christmas, Mother's Day, and Easter. Some people don't know what the church looks like without a casket on the altar. Joab's Worship was based on consumerism. What can the church do for me? What does your church offer me? No, we don't need any more freeloaders. And we don't need any more uh, hobos on the train. Uh, what can you do for us? What can you do for the church? What can you contribute to the ministry? Number two, Joab was guilty of insincere sacrifices. He's holding on to the horns of the altar. He's pulling on the altar. Mm -hmm. He's pulling off of the altar. But he's putting nothing on the altar. Uh, I joined church this morning. Monday, I get a call. Uh, Pastor, can you pay my rent? You just joined yesterday. You pull it on the altar. <laughs> I wouldn't have said it if it wasn't true. Uh, yeah. Joab was not interested in putting anything on the altar. He was just trying to get something off the altar. Uh, jo Joab had no substance to offer, no treasure. Uh, no, he came to the, to the altar empty-handed. In biblical days, the altar was the place where sacrifices were made. And when you came to church, you brought a sacrifice. You put something on the altar. You, you sacrificed something. You killed something. You had a burnt offering. You put something on the altar. Tell somebody, you ought to put something on the altar. Mm-hmm, it got quiet on that one. Go and tell somebody it's a beautiful day in my neighborhood. Uh, jo Joab had uh, no, no substance to offer. He had no service to offer. I mean, he gave no, no treasure. He gave no time to God. And this is interesting, interesting, interesting. You know, I, I do believe in deathbed confession. I do believe in deathbed salvation. You can't be saved at the last minute. But what a tragedy it is to wait until the end to get saved. Because when you give your life to God, in the prime of your life, you save not only a soul, but you save a life. But when you wait till the end, all you do is save a soul. Uh, you ought to put some service in at the house of God. Put some time in. Get involved in ministry. Find something to do around here. Just standing around. I had something to do. Jo Joab had no supplication. I got to move on. He had no supplication to offer. In other words, he's at the altar, but he ain't praying. I mean, nowhere in this text do you find Joab praying. He's about to die. He's afraid that the king's going to kill him, but he still ain't got sense enough to pray. Ooh. 
He, he never said, Father, I stretch <laughs> my hands to thee, no other help I know. He, he never said, uh, I need thee <laughs> every day and every hour. No. But, but when I come to the altar, uh, I, I come here to pray. Uh, and that's why we sing that old song, When You Bow Down at the Altar. Please don't forget to pray for me. Number three, Joab was guilty of ineffective repentance. Benaniah discovers, as I get ready to leave you now, that Joab is in the church. So he runs into the church and he says, uh, Joab, your number has come up. The king wants to see you. Joab hollers back at Benaniah and said, tell the king I'm in church. Tell the king I'm at the altar now. And so Benaniah went back and told the king what Joab had to say. And King Solomon said, wasn't nothing holy about the Joab and ain't no need in him trying to fake it until he makes it now. Go on and kill him right where he is. If he's at the altar, that's a good place to make a sacrifice of him. And so Benaniah goes back to the temple and he takes out a sword and he kills Joab right there on the spot. And I know, I know, I know, I know somebody saying, Pastor, where's the hope and where's the joy in the text? Because you've been preaching mm -hmm, about a pitiful situation. In fact, uh, Pastor, you've been like uh, going to the doctor and getting uh, a diagnosis and uh, getting a prognosis. Uh, but Pastor, do you have a prescription for my life? Pastor, what can make my life better? I don't want to end up uh, like Joab. Well, I want to tell you, uh huh. if you want to get it together, you got to be mindful of what Joab did wrong. Joab had no remorse. Mm -hmm. Yes, Joab had not been sorry for what he had done. But I also need to tell you, there's a difference between remorse and repentance. Remorse says I'm sorry, but repentance says I'm going to do something about it. People come to church every week praying for the same thing and say, this is the last time I'm going to pray about it because I'm going to get it together. But you come back next week praying for the same old thing. Talking about God pick me up and turn my life all the way around. That's too far. 360 puts you back in the same place, heading in the same direction. Tell somebody you need a new walk. You need a new talk and you need a new attitude. Joab had no regrets. They, 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 they uh, uh -huh, told us the other day that O.J. Simpson came up for parole for his uh, robbery conviction. And as he stood before the parole board, they questioned whether he had remorse or regret. They questioned whether he really uh, was repentant because all he did is try to explain and justify his behavior and his life. Mm -hmm. But I've come by to tell somebody uh, when you come before the divine parole board, you're not come trying to justify yourself, but you ought to come clean with the Lord. And therefore, Joab had no redemption because he didn't know what repentance was all about. But I've come to tell somebody that uh, uh -huh, 1 John 1 and 9 says, if we will confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness and so when I come to the altar I've learned to come clean with God I've learned to lay it all on the line I've learned to put it all on the table because the God we serve 
is a forgiving God. And can I let you in on something? There's no need in you dying at the altar. No need of you dying in church when Jesus has already died on the altar for you. Have I got a witness here? You don't have to die at the doorway to life, but you can find joy and peace in his house. I'm out of here, but I remember when Hurricane Irene hit the East Coast, there was a woman sitting in her home. She thought about the storm, and then she remembered there were some women who played bridge at her church on this same day. And so she left her house, went to the church where others were gathered. When the storm passed over, she went back home to discover her house had been completely destroyed. Everything was wiped off the foundation. And then she paused right then and there and began to thank God that she found refuge in his house. And they began to write about her story and the newspaper said woman found safety salvation and security in God's house I've come to tell somebody you can come to God's house you don't have to wait till you're in a crisis but you can come to him right now that's why David said I was glad when they said unto me let us go into the house of the Lord is there anybody that's glad to be here right now is there anybody excited about being in the house of the Lord I wish I had somebody who could say like we used to say it in the old church I'm glad to be in the service one more time Thank you for being a part of our Growing in the Spirit broadcast today, and I hope that the word bless your life. I want to extend to you an invitation to get to know Jesus Christ. Romans 10, 9 says that thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead. Thou shalt be saved. Today is the day of salvation. Also, I would like to invite you to be a part of our worship experience here at the St. John Church. I look forward to seeing you real soon. To purchase a copy of today's message in its entirety on CD or DVD, call us at 1-888-888-SJBC or visit our website. Join Pastor Denny D. Davis and the St. John family for one of our five weekend worship services, our Dress Down Casual service on Saturdays at 6 p.m. at our Grand Prairie location, or Sundays at Grand Prairie at 7 a.m., 9 a.m., and 11 a.m., or our South Lake campus at 10 a.m. St. John Church, ministering in multiple locations. Church Unleashed.